Well, good morning, FPC. Good morning online. If you are joining us, we are glad to be in the house of God. If you are a visitor or, you know, one of, one of our own who's visiting us, Kathy, <laughs> welcome in. We love to have you, and we love to be in the house of God together because we are the people of God. So let us stand and let us believe that the battle belongs to the Lord, and greater is he that is within us than he who is in the world. So let us put our hands together this morning, this Sunday. The battle is the Lord's. Thank you, Jesus. Nothing can 
ahead and Pastor Kate is with us this morning. Dennis is in England, so uh, he hasn't been posting anything on Facebook, but I will say that the man he is traveling with, John Bowen, has been posting <coughs> numerous posts about being in Oxford, England, at the university there. Uh, he's taken tours and gone to churches and libraries and all the things I guess one does in Oxford in this university town. So uh, keep him in your prayers and I know that the rest of, the, of us are praying for the mission team in Mexico right now. They, uh, they were going to be broadcasting today at 9 a.m. And I don't know, did anybody tune in and see them? I was getting in my car to drive here. Well, they were on Instagram or YouTube yes. or something. Instagram. I don't know. So please remember them in your prayers. For uh, We'll be praying later for them. If you need some hints, uh, their health, their ministry, reaching out to others, touching lives, and being, um, being a blessing to the church in San Bartolo. So welcome to First Presbyterian. I can't tell if there are any guests because I can't really see much farther than Kathy Paz. Um, I had my eye injections on Friday. So um, let's come before the Lord this morning and let's recite our confession here from 1 John chapter 2. Read with me. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey him commands. The person who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if we obey his word, God's love is truly made complete in us. This is how we show we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Let us pray. Lord, be with us this morning. Send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and help us on our way. Lord, be with those in Mexico. Keep them safe and healthy and let them lead a productive mission trip now. Lord, we pray for Pastor Dennis in England that he would have a wonderful rest and be um, intellectually and spiritually stimulated by this seminar. Lord, we're here, protect us from the one who would trip us up, who would confuse us, the Prince of Lies. And let us enjoy one another as you taught us how with the breaking of bread together. Lord, bless this service, bless the words of my mouth, that they might be pleasing to you and edifying to the congregation. I pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us be grateful for the many things that the Lord has done. Would you stand? Let us sing 
grateful. This is the day that he has made. We will rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it. So let us stand together and let us rejoice together for he is with us. Yes. God is here. Yes, he is. And this morning we get to sing it together. You get to be part of us. You know, we're missing Chris, so we need you to sing out, sing from your heart. Let's put our hands together. Say it with me. God is here. God is here. God is here. Yes, he is. Now you get to say, oh, oh, oh.
gives us hope, living hope, not hope that, you know, maybe someday we will see him or meet him, yes, up in heaven, but today he's here with us, and he is our living hope. Thank you, Lord. Yes.
Um, when I fill in for Pastor Dennis, I always worry how many people are going to come. Are they going to say, well, Dennis isn't there. I'm going to stay home. He'll never know. So it's, it's good to see so many faces. Before we get to our scripture reading, I want to remind you to look at the back side of your bulletin. It has all kinds of information in it including our weekly classes and news. We're going to the ball game pretty soon. Uh, when is it? Friday the 30th of August. And there's a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall. So if you want to go and get these um, discounted tickets for the group, uh, please sign up because uh, we have a limited time that we can buy these tickets. Uh, the schedule is there. The Revelation class is meeting again. We met last week, and we're going to meet for three more weeks before I'm leaving town again. So um, please join us for that. We are just started Chapter 2. 
And remember to pray for uh, Pastor Dennis and the mission team in Mexico. Sandra, do you want to give us the reading? Oh, we should do the passing of the peace, shouldn't we? I forget. It's not on the bulletin, so I... Oh, greeting and passing of the peace. It is on the bulletin. Please stand and greet your neighbors, and I'll let Sandra herd you back. Is it on the mic? There we go. Good morning. I'm glad to see you all. Excited getting to see each other. Um, just a reminder that you'll be able to do this in the fellowship hall, so feel free to um, hold on to those conversations and then carry them over to the fellowship hall after the service. Um, for now, we'll go ahead and go into our scripture reading for today. Our first uh, reading comes from the book of Psalm, chapter 20, verses 6 through 9. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, have victory to the, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. Our second reading comes from the book of John, chapter 20, verse 30, through chapter 21, verse 14. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples, by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large amount of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him where he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. 
Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning and for this time that we get to gather here, Lord, and we thank you for um, our team in Mexico who's also gathering together there um, as we speak, Lord. I pray that you speak um, through both Katie today, Chris at uh, the Mexico Church, Lord, and um, may we be all open to receive from your word. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I'm having my little wobblies this morning. Some, I've been working really hard with my therapy. And some days lately, I don't have them. But I have them today. So if I never let go of the pulpit, you'll know why. I don't want to look like I've been hitting the communion wine or anything. Um, Marlene, the songs this morning spoke so much to my sermon, it was as if we had compared notes. I do have a couple more you could have added, but when we get to them, you'll recognize it. Our scripture today reflects on the resurrection life, and it's a picture of the abundance of God's power and love. Last Sunday, Pastor Dennis addressed the issues in our culture surrounding uh, prosperity theology, remember? Please don't get confused with resurrection abundance and prosperity theology. They are very different things. While prosperity theology focuses on your wallet and your possessions, and how God shows his love for us by giving us material things. Resurrection abundance is how God shows us his love for us by giving us peace, love, grace, joy, forgiveness, mercy, courage, and everlasting life. It is impossible to put a price tag on God's gifts to us. As we begin, remember to consider one thing, abundance. This story provides a clear picture of life without Jesus and a life following Jesus. Let's look at how they're revealed. Our reading today begins with chapter 20, verse 30. Jesus did many miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, these two verses sum up the Gospel of John. Look at what they say. Jesus did many miracles. He did them in the presence of the disciples and other people. So many, in fact, that not all of them are recorded here. This was written for you so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have everlasting life in his name. Amen. So the scripture this morning is set along the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. Or as the, that was what the Romans called it. The Jews called it the Sea of Galilee. And they probably still did to each other. That's why we call it the Sea of Galilee today. And not the Sea of Tiberias. We don't know how, um, how many days these events occurred after the resurrection, but we can kind of figure it out. We know Jesus walked on the earth in his resurrected form for 40 days. When we, um, 
lay out a chronology of his resurrected life on earth, we have to take clues from the various Gospels. Jesus revealed himself to Thomas a week after his first appearance. So this appearance in Galilee must have happened several days later. Why do I say this? It's roughly a hundred miles from Jerusalem to Galilee. So that's a hike of at least three days by the disciples. Most likely it was nearer to a week. Did any of them stop off to discuss the situation with people they knew who lived along the way? To tell them of Jesus' actual death and then the fact that they had seen him and spoken to him? To share the fantastic news that they had seen the wounds on his hands and his side and that Jesus was alive. Wouldn't you stop? I certainly would. This is exceptional news and worthy of stopping to share, which would cause the natural delays along the way to the Sea of Galilee. Now, in chapter 21, let's start. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee. The sons of Deb Zebedee and two other disciples were together. If you add them up, you realize that this is two-thirds of the disciples. They're hanging out in Galilee now. I'm going to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So we have these seven guys here. And then if you think about number eight would have been Judas, but he's not in the picture anymore. So there are only four left behind in, um, in Jerusalem. Maybe they had gone to visit their families. Thomas had seen Jesus and touched him. And Nathaniel hadn't been listed previously as a disciple, but he's included here. The sons of Zebedee are not named, but we've met them before, so we know them as James and John. And finally, two more disciples who aren't named. We can project all we want who they might be. So now these seven men are back in Galilee, maybe at Peter's house, and he suggests a night's fishing trip. Maybe Peter's wife or his mother suggested that, in her opinion, some fresh fish would go a long way to feeding these guys who are hanging out in her living room. So they set out. Historians will tell us that night fishing is the best fishing in the Sea of Galilee. And the large fish are all caught out in the middle of the lake. And in the, in the shallower waters around the edges, we can find lots of small fish. So they go out fishing, and it's an opportune time. We don't know how far out they went seeking fish, but it seems they were out there most of the night. Toward dawn, it's clear they had been unsuccessful. Don't they call that being skunked? I like to examine stories in Scripture and put myself in their place. I put myself in the place of one of those guys, and I thought, what would I be thinking? What would I be feeling about this? Or maybe um, I think about what the observations of a crowd would be, how I would feel if I was standing somewhere else. I wonder if they felt safe out there on the lake that night. There weren't any neighbors or family around to criticize them or say things about Jesus that they didn't want to hear. 
their gossiping neighbors would have been left behind. If you've been in a small town, you know how everybody knows your business. And it was safe to talk about everything they had experienced in the last month or so. Those last hard teachings of Jesus when they were in Jerusalem. The triumphal procession. The final Passover meal. And then the arrest. The degradation. The phony trial and execution of Jesus. Perhaps they talked about their confusion. They knew him as the Son of God. How could they be so wrong after everything that they had been taught and had witnessed themselves? And then these last extraordinary couple of weeks, they actually saw Jesus and spoke with him and saw the wounds on his hands and feet and side. He was alive, but he had died. How was this at all possible? So perhaps that night they just sat out there in the boat and tried to make sense of it all and didn't carefully tend their lines or even drop the nets over the side. And at dawn they were probably tired and hungry and so they came back to shore empty-handed. Now, I want to suggest to you that a life without Jesus is reflected in this graphic picture of the disciples with their empty nets. Confused, empty-handed, empty-hearted, and disappointed. The reality of living without Christ leads to such a life. A life only partially fulfilled. A life focused on today without the grander focus of eternity. An eternity of tomorrows with God. That is an empty net life. But you wouldn't be here today if you weren't entirely convinced of that. Or are you convinced there is nothing more than living and dying on this little planet? Do you believe that your life has no purpose? I'd like to offer you some resurrection abundance. But let's get back to our poor boatload of disappointed fishermen first. Verses 4 to 6. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Now, it's very early in the morning. It might be dim out. I woke up this morning before 5, and it was pretty dark with the overcast, and I couldn't see across the street even. So for them to try to identify a figure standing on the shore at least 100 yards away would have been very difficult. I wonder if any of them were a little nearsighted or maybe their eyes were tired of being out in the dark all night. I know I couldn't recognize most of you at the other end of the church, much less a football field between us. On the other hand, it could have been fully daylight. We don't know. And they were all blessed with farsightedness. And their lack of recognition is due to a spiritual situation. I suggest we must not read too much into their lack of recognition. 
for some reason, they simply didn't recognize Jesus. A man on the shore calls out to them, asking if they had caught anything, and they replied in the negative, no. And again he calls out to them, this time suggesting that they drop their net into the shallow water where the little fish live. Do they think he's just another fisherman offering advice? I imagine small fish would be better to take home than no fish at all. They probably still had the sail up, trying to catch any breeze to bring them close to the shore. And the right side might have offered them an unobstructed place to lower the net and begin to bring it back. For whatever reason, they take his advice. Drop the net in and start to haul it back on board. Verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. He's not naked in the boat. He's got something wrapped around him like a loincloth or something, like underwear, sort of. So don't think it's odd that he's in the boat without his outer garment. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. This is where I get the hundred yards from. I'm not making anything up here. When they landed, they saw a fire of glowing coal, burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net had not torn. To give us a number like 153 means that somebody actually counted them and recorded this number. It is not a spiritual number like, oh, there were seven. We don't know if there were seven or ten or five, but with 153, we can be pretty darn sure that there were 153 and they were all large fish. Suddenly, one of the disciples recognizes it was Jesus, and he tells Peter, an ever impetuous Peter jumps into the water. I love Peter. We don't know if he's swimming or wading in toward shore to see Jesus, but Peter is on his way. The other disciples bring in the boat and find that Jesus has started a fire to cook some fish and has some bread for them. How nice to find this after a disappointing night. Jesus is there to welcome them with fresh bread and fire. We see that Peter returns to the boat and drags it ashore. Okay. Now, this is the denouement. This is the point of the story. Peter drags that net ashore. It turns out to not be filled with the little fish. You know, I don't know what we're talking about. Little fish, typically found in shallow waters. Instead, it is filled with the large fish found out in the deep waters of the lake. In fact, there are 153 fish in the net. That's a lot of fish. They must each weigh several pounds. I don't know, five or more pounds, do you think, of fish that size? Because seven men were unable to pull them into the boat. John never suggests that the boat was small and the seven of them filled it up so there was no room for the fish. Instead, he says clearly, they were unable to haul the net 
in because of the large number of fish. This is an image of resurrection abundance. Jesus offers us more fish than we can haul in. This is the abundance of what God has for his people. More than we can imagine. Instead of the emptiness of the night's fishing excursion. The images in this, these verses are striking. After the natural ending of the gospel in verse 20, and we read that, verses 30 and 31, that would have been a natural place to end the book. But John was led to add this particular story. And we should consider why. What we can learn from it. Perhaps we all need one more reminder of what God is offering us. What he is calling us to. A life more abundantly lived. More fulfilling than a huge haul of fish to some fishermen. We might consider it laughable to consider this an example of God's provision, God's abundance, God's blessings for us. But for those men, it was all those things and more. It was exactly what they needed at that moment. So let's finish the story before we unpack how it affects us. Verses 12 to 14. Jesus said to them, come and have some breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. That is the end of the Gospel of John. Jesus invites the disciples to join him for this early morning breakfast. How many times in the last three years had he said those words to them, come and have breakfast? He is inviting them again to sit down with him and eat. And do you notice the phrase, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? I was bothered by that word, dared. It didn't seem natural to me. It didn't seem like a good translation. I had to look it up. In English, the word dared has several synonyms. It means having courage to challenge or to presume or to goad or taunt. But in the Greek, it simply means having courage. Did they want him to say, it is I, your friend and teacher, Jesus. But none of them dares ask and make a fool of himself. Because the evidence is before their eyes. It is he. They will not question their beloved teacher. And then Jesus serves them the bread and the fish. The words are nearly the same as we will use next week for our communion service. He might once again have blessed the bread and the fish and passed it as he had done so many times before. A sweet time together in the early morning. A lesson for all of us that Jesus will be with us all the time, even at breakfast. John closes this story by noting that this is the third time the disciples had seen the resurrected Jesus. Remember, a number of them had seen Jesus on that first day. 
and then a much larger group in the upper room when Thomas was present and he touched him. These three are the only ones recorded in the Gospel of John. We know there are others in the other Gospels. So where have we gone this morning? At his death on Good Friday, Jesus fulfilled the promise of his life. One man died for all. During Easter, we celebrate the gifts from his birth, hope, love, joy, and peace, as well as the gifts from his death, forgiveness from our sins, and eternal salvation. Jesus' birth brought a new joy to humanity, the joy of living in God's plan. I have that joy deep within me that bubbles up to share with others. But I have lived without God, living for myself, making my own plans, standing in my mistakes, achieving my own successes, walking through valleys of despair and disillusionment and climbing to peaks of happiness. But I know the difference of a life with the joy God brings. I could never turn my back on it. We sing songs of hope, proclaiming, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, the hope birthed in Bethlehem and fulfilled on the cross. It is the faith that we place in Christ alone that he stands in victory over death. Because of his death, I am not afraid to die. I belong to God and sin's curse has lost its grip on me. My hope is such that no power in hell and no scheme of man will ever pluck me from his hand. Don't you love that image? I think of me standing on God's hand and Satan trying to grab me out. He has talons on his hands. My hope lies in the resurrection of Jesus from his death on the cross. Do you have that hope? The sweet assurance that you belong to God. I can state that without any doubt that no matter what I have to face in my life, it is easier when I walk with God. This is the abundant life that Jesus' resurrection makes possible. A life where our joys and sorrows, victories and defeats, gains and losses, the power and love of the presence of God are there to hold us up. It is only through God's love for each of us that any of this is possible. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is love. This is God's promise to us. It began in Bethlehem and was fulfilled on the cross. This is resurrection abundance. And with this love... This joy and this hope comes peace. It's a package deal. It's all wrapped up together, tightly interwound. It is not like a buffet. I'll take some joy, please, but no thank you to peace or love. We get it all mixed up together with forgiveness and eternal salvation. When we say yes, please, to God, he will infuse us with hope, soak us in joy, and fulfill us in love. God will distill us, 
purify us in forgiveness over and over as much as we need it. And then at the end of our days on earth, we spend eternity with him. This is resurrection abundance. That really sounds like a net filled with big fish, doesn't it? Are you living a resurrection abundant life? Do you need to have that conversation with God today? Is there something holding you back from experiencing that fulfillment that I've talked about that I have? So take a moment right now with God. He knows what's going on in your life. You don't have to tell him the problems you're facing, the questions you have. He's just waiting for you. Let's pray. Lord God, our perfect heavenly Father, we come before your throne today and want to be bathed in your abundance. I pray that your healing will permeate each of us. Grant us the joy of our salvation. Fill us so full that doubt and guilt cannot creep into the corners to steal your abundance from us. Lord, infuse us with hope in our lives and our purpose. Let our faith be a beacon to this sad, sick world. I pray that we will be filled with your love for one another, for the lost and hurting. Teach us to be worthy of the gift of Jesus Christ in our lives. Help us to walk in your abundant love as we pray together as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If the deacons would come forward, we will take the offering now. You can put an offering in the plate or in the boxes at the doorways or online. There are instructions here about how to do that. this song, When We All Get to Heaven. Um, you all might know it, and this is one that Jean kind of asked for, so let us sing it all together. Yes? Okay. Count us off, Carlos. Let us put our hands together, because on that day, we will see the Lord face to face. Amen? Here we go. Thank you. 
been given. You woke up this morning. You got out of bed. Maybe you took a hot shower. Fixed some breakfast. I can't even tell you how many in the population of this world cannot do most of those things. Those are all fish that we have here. Consider what your fish is. Maybe you have a whole bunch of them. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.